Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the first webinar of 2023 in the New York Natural Heritage Program's IMAP Invasives monthly webinar series. So thank you all so much for joining. Um, today, our topic is getting the most out of IMAP data using the IMAP report tool to create species lists and data snapshots. Um, we're very grateful to have Brittany Hernan from Western New York PRISM with us today to um, give a brief presentation on how they use the reports and also exports in the uh, Western New York PRISM, uh, particularly to, to in partnering with um, other organizations or other groups. Um, and yeah, so with that, I'll just kind of get started with what we have going on today. Um, so this is kind of how we're laying out the webinar for today. Um, so I'm going to give a brief introduction to what reports are, and then we'll hear from Brittany. And uh, then I'll give some more detail by going through a, a brief demo slash tutorial. Um, and then I'll talk about exports and WMS, and we should have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, so I encourage participants to enter any questions they have throughout the webinar in the chat box as we go. Um, and we might answer some of those either in the chat box or, or ver verbally um, during the webinar, but we will save a lot of it to the end as well. Um, and at the end, there will be an opportunity to unmute if you wanna ask uh, questions verbally. So just to give some context to what the IMAP Invasives report tool is, um, I'm talking about a specific functionality in IMAP right now, uh, not IMAP reports like uh, observation records. I'm specifically talking, talking about the report tool. Um, so basically that's, uh, it exists to kind of help us make quick data summaries and data snapshots. So here I just have a, an image of the IMAP data in um, sort of the area to the west of Albany um, with a bunch of the data layers turned on. And you can see there's all sorts of polygons and points. Um, the green are the, the confirmed records and the yellow is the not detected records. Um, so you can see there's there's all this information on where invasive species are or where they've been looked for. And it's really great to have all this information um, if you want to really hone in on a specific specific location, um, but it's also kind of a lot of information if you're really just looking for what are the most common species in your area or what are the records, what are the most commonly reported species, um, what are the species that are nearby but not here yet, uh, that sort of stuff. So the, the report tool exists to kind of translate the complex spatial information into quick uh, data tables that can be more easily digested. Um, so, for example, we have a species list by geography report where you can get a summary of the species reported within whatever geography you select. So, maybe a county, maybe a prism, um, and also the approaching region report, which is kind of the reverse of that. So, it's the species that are not in your selected county or prism or whatever you choose but they are within a cert certain distance um, from the boundaries of that region. And there are also um, two other types of reports which incorporate uh, the, the area of polygons. So area treated, which sums up the areas of polygons, of treatment polygons, um, to kind of give you a total areas treated. And then infested area does the same thing, but for presence records. And with that, I'll um, so there's a, a lot of different applications for this, and um, Western New York uses these reports in a couple of cool ways. So I'll hand it over to Brittany to talk about um, how they use the reports. Great. Thank you. Um, and I work with Western New York PRISM as the Terrestrial Program Manager. And so just a little background before I jump into how we use IMAP Invasives reports. Uh, West New York PRISM has a crew assistance program where partners in our region can submit proposals for our seasonal management crew to assist with invasive species projects. And so one category is survey and mapping, where we go out and survey um, for invasive species and collect data on percent cover, distribution. Um, we take points, polygons, and lines, so you get location, acreage, things like that. And so this is really good for organizations maybe that have acquired a new 
um, property and want to know what's on there so they can plan invasive species management or some volunteers or friends groups that are eager to get out there but maybe don't know what's around to even start with. Um, and so each time we do one of these invasive species surveys for our partners, we um, give each one a unique project in IMAP invasives, and this is to help organize data for our partners and for future removal work. And then after the surveys are complete, we create a summary of the work that we provide to our partners. And so I use the report function in IMAP invasives to get information for these partner summaries. And so it helps us ensure that the summaries are, you know, user friendly for people to continue invasive species management. And so when creating the summaries, the first thing I do is filter by the project. So I put a little screenshot on here, just showing that you would pick your specific project. And this kind of gets rid of all the other data that's um, in IOP invasives and just helps focus in on one specific um, Invasive Species Project, and just a little plug to use IMAP Invasives Projects. Um, it's just really helpful if you collect data for partners and they log on and they want to figure out where this information is. If you, you know, you can even provide a screenshot like this and just tell them, you know, type in this exact project and it'll get you to your data. Um, and so, like I said, in this case, the first step is filtering by that project. Um, okay. And so for this example, I'm going to focus on the Crane Ridge Association project that Western York Prism carried out in 2021. So this is a community of homeowners that are incredibly dedicated to identifying invasive species, removing invasive species, and then planting um, native plants in their community. And so I know there's a demo portion um, later, so this is just kind of a quick overview of the report function. But to create that IMAP Invasives report, I filtered by Western York Prism Crane Ridge 2021. Um, like I showed in the previous slide, and then I just zoomed in on the data. So this is just the points, polygons, and lines that our crew collected for this specific site. Um, and so after that, I use that export report function, make sure it's on the report feature. Um, and then um, I use the species list by geography report. And so you give it a unique name, and then it will ask you to um, define the area. And so I just draw a polygon that just to make sure it includes all of the data that's collected so that everything is represented in the report. Um, and then here it shows that it has edit boundary area. So if you draw a polygon and you're not happy with it or you want to adjust it, you could do that. Um, and then, you know, a couple of fields that you fill in. And after that, um, it's ready to run the report. All right. And so after the report runs, it lists out all of the species found in that geography that you selected. It includes the scientific name, the common name, and then it also includes a count, so a number next to it. And so this is the number of points, lines, or polygons recorded for that species. And I just wanted to include a little snapshot to show what it looks like. Um, it also has some data disclaimers at the bottom. When I include this IMAP Invasives report in our summary for partners, I include everything. So the entire list of the species, and I also like to include the data disclaimers just in case the partners never go back and log on to IMAP Invasives, they kind of get everything that, that I saw when I ran the report. Um, all right. And so this is a screenshot of the full IMAP Invasives species list from the IMAP Invasives report that we provided to the Crane Ridge Association um, after the project was complete. And so our seasonal staff, staff members also use this survey data to help put forth some management suggestions for our partners. And then this list really helps me kind of go through and edit and finalize those recommendations. So for instance, anytime there's a one or a two under that confirmed count, um, that kind of alerts me that I should be looking into these points, lines, or polygons, because if a species is only found in one spot, it's probably a high priority for management, so you can get rid of those few, you know, plants that are found before they spread to a new area. Um, so I do use this as a guideline. I'm just understanding that that one could be, like for the knotweed, one 15-acre polygon, and so then that may not be within management capacity. So I use this as a guide, then I click on those actual 
observations that were made, but you know, if it's one spot with a few knotweed plants, we want to tell that partner this should be a priority for management before knotweed takes over the whole property. Um, and this helps us determine best management practices and give recommendations to the partner. And so in that project summary, I include this entire report. Um, I also let them know the project name and I include a little description of how they could access and filter data in IOP invasives in case they want to go back and do this. So really for us, the reports help staff make management recommendations and just provide that quick, easy list to look at species found on a site. Um, okay. And then kind of the final step for those partner summaries is we export the IMAP invasives data and create these maps for our partners. We're always trying to think of different ways to present and summarize the data. So maybe a list is helpful, maybe a map, maybe instructions on how to go on to IMAP invasives and look at the data. We just want partners to have a bunch of options so they can choose what works best for them. So with this summary, they get, you know, they now have that IMAP invasives report maps and instructions on how to log into IMAP invasives and continue to work with this data to plan for management. And the folks um, at Crane Ridge use this 2021 survey data to apply for the career assistance program in 2022. And so we help them treat invasive shrubs on site. And now they're actually using IMAP invasives to look up where hemlock willy adelgid has been found and they're getting folks to go out and survey for that. I'm actually working with them on Saturday to give them a hemlock willy adelgid training and they're really eager to adopt, you know, parks to go survey. Um, so I think using these IMAP invasives tools such as reports, but then explaining them to partners can, you know, really get others interested and start to use these tools on their own. Um, all right. And so then just those take home messages, the IMAP invasives reports provide that quick and easy list of species and then can help us begin to prioritize management, make recommendations for our partners and the IMAP invasives reports and other functions can be you know, provided and explained to partners and hopefully increase IMAP invasives use um, and help you know, our partners be able to access this data for management. And then just um, quickly, I'll point out that if you're in the West York Fism region, our crew assistance program is open and accepting proposals, but only until uh, this Friday, January 27th at 5 p.m. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brittany. That was great. It's great to hear how you're using the, the reports in your PRISM. Um, I did want to pause quickly. I don't think there's anything in the chat now, but if people have any questions, please enter those in. Um, and we can look at those as they come in or at the end. Um, but thank you so much, Brittany. And now I can move on to the next session section where we'll go into a little bit more detail on how to do some of the things um, like what Brittany was doing. Um, so I will give a tutorial in a second, but I did want to frame a few things first. Um, so one is that there are four main different report types in IMAP. Um, so one is the species list by geography. So that's uh, the one that Brittany was showing. Um, and it's called that because one of the easiest, one of the, the most basic ways to use it or uh, to give a really clear, simple to understand thing to partners would be the, to just put on the, the, present, the presence layer and run the report. Um, for your geography, and then you'll have a really easy to digest list of the species that are in that geography and how many are reported. Um, but there is also a, another way you can use the species list by geography tool, um, because you can turn on any of the other layers. Um, so you can turn on not detected and treatment, um, and you can turn on iNaturalist data even. And so then it becomes more of a, uh, a report of a summary of all the records entered. So it becomes kind of more than the simple species list and turns into like a data table that tells you all of the different records going in for your specific project or region or whatever you filtered on. Um, so that's that's kind of the, I'd say the the most most commonly used report. And I think that's for good reason. I think it's really the most uh, versatile report we have. Um, and then we do have three more kind of more specific reports that are more useful for certain things. So we have the approaching region report, 
Um, that creates a list of species not in your selected area, but within a buffer that you choose. Um, so, for instance, you could choose your county and a 20 mile distance, and it'll give you all the species in that 20 mile buffer that are not in your county yet. So kind of early detection species or maybe underreported species. Um, and then there's two reports that take into the area of polygons. So you, uh, you can pick which species you're interested in and then run an infested area report and it'll give you, it'll kind of add up the total acres or whichever unit you pick for that species. Um, and then you can do the same thing for area treated, which would use the treatment records instead of the presence records. Um, and I did just want to mention a couple tips and perhaps underutilized features. Um, so for the species list by geography report, um, I just want to highlight again that it has that total number of records per species, um, like what Brittany was showing earlier. And I did also want to highlight that it works on other layers that you turned on. Um, so depending on what you're using the report for, sometimes you just want that simple list of present species, um, but other times you might want a list of any record type that was reported um, to kind of get a summary. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight the fact that the filter tool can be used in conjunction with, in conjunction with a lot of the reports. Um, so Brittany showed that with how um, she filtered on the project, and then she was able to report specifically on that project. So that's a super useful feature. Um, for instance, you could filter on aquatic plants and run a report to get an aquatic plant list. Um, you could filter on certain dates or certain projects or your organization to get a summary of um, like just your 2022 data or something like that. And I did also wanna point out that um, as you use the report feature, please remember that there are these descriptions um, uh, that kind of have more information and additional details for each of the individual reports. Um, so now I'll switch over to the online interface and um, give a quick demonstration. Um, so here I am logged into IMAP. Um, one of the examples I was going to do is a, uh, I want to get a data summary for a volunteer project. Um, I randomly selected the APIP forest pest uh, volunteer. Oh, sorry. I need to just switch my sharing. I'll just stop and reshare. All right. I think people can see my IMAP browser now. Um, so I am going to zoom into the Adirondack region. So I'm trying to get a data summary on a volunteer project that happened there last year. And I'm going to start applying some filters because the report will respond to that. Um, so the project I chose is the APIP volunteer forest pest monitoring. Um, they focused on HWA and beech leaf disease last year. Um, and so I want, I decided I want last year's data. Um, so I'm going to do records after December 31st, 2021, but before January 1st, 2023. Um, so in between that, that will be all the 2022 dates. Um, click apply filter. And um, I know that this volunteer group reported not detected records as well. Um, in theory, they might have also reported unconfirmed, um, but generally a lot of those records do get confirmed. Um, so that's kind of showing me the data. Um, in theory, if I was doing something else, I could turn on the iNaturalist data or the treatment data, but I know that these are the relevant layers for this group, so I'll leave it at those. And um, so now I'll go into the report tool to kind of get a, a quick summary. 
So I click the export slash report button at the top right. I'll toggle over to reports. Um, if I want in, if I want a brief rundown on the different reports, I can click this button to go to our help web page. Um, but right now I know that I want to use the species list by ge geography. Um, again, it has some tips right here that you can collapse. Um, and let's say I don't actually need a summary for the entire program right now. Maybe I'm going to see someone from Warren County and I want to highlight the efforts in Warren, Warren County last year. Um, so I can define our selective boundary area. Um, I can, if you have a very specific project you're reporting on, you can use that uh, draw a polygon tool like Brittany used. Um, and I should mention that by uh, right now. Um, so you click that define or select boundary area and use existing geography. Um, so you have several things to choose from. So you could do your state, your water body, uh, county. Um, I'm going to choose county for now. And then you, it tells you to click on the map. Um, so I said Warren County, I'll click right there. And if I wanted to add a buffer, I could do that um, or redraw or change, um, but I'll just stick with that. And so I'll call this uh, APIP Volunteers uh, Warren County May 20. Um, and if I want, I could add a snapshot to the report. Um, so you could zoom in and um, it would actually grab this uh, quick menu. Um, I'll leave that out for now. Um, but then you, you click run report and I have it preloaded. Um, it, this report's pretty simple, so it would probably take a minute or so, um, but I'll just open it up here. Um, Oh, um, actually, I'll see if I, I'll just try running it again and see how fast it goes. I do have my next report saved as a PDF, so we won't have to wait for loading that time. Okay, I'll just use this report that I already have, um, but I just hadn't filtered on HWA and beech leaf disease. So this will be a little bit different than what that report will generate. Um, but you can see it um, has the title I made on top. It has uh, my name because I created the report, it has my account name, um, the date I made it and the layers that I queried. Um, and it tells you whatever filter parameters you specified. So you can see the dates that I specified and the project. And um, this is one I ran before the webinar and I had not added the species filters. Um, so that does not appear there, um, but it shows you the presence records. So Hemoglia Delgid, there were 17 confirmed records and no unconfirmed records. They had all been confirmed. Um, and then I also have the not detected table. Um, and so you can see lots of HWA and lots of um, several beech leaf disease um, records because those were the species that were focused on. And it does also uh, list the uh, geometry that you chose. So in this case, Warren County and gives you some basic metrics about that geography. Um, and then the data disclaimers at the bottom. And so, um, there are a couple ways you can use this sort of report. So you can uh, copy this into an Excel file. So you can it kind of paste things into the rows and columns, just like on the table. Um, so you can take that data into your own Excel file and do with it what you need to. 
Um, or if you're kind of just sharing this report um, with someone as a quick snapshot, you can actually print to PDF, um, and that's a way to, to save this information as well. Um, and that's what Brittany was showing at the beginning. Um, she had printed them to PDFs that she shared with her partners. Um, so that's my first example. And then I have one more, but when I guess it did load. So you'll see in this version, um, it's just the uh, HWA and beech leaf disease. So that was the one difference. Um, so my second example, I was going to do an approaching region county for or an approaching region species list uh, report for Tompkins County. And so I'm going to clear my filter and then start over. So I decided I would do um, terrestrial plants um, just to show another way that the filter tool can be used with the reports. So I'll do plants and then terrestrial. Um, and that's all I'll apply in terms of filters. Um, you could also filter on your own records and make a report just for your data, but I'll just do any records for now. Um, and I'll focus just on confirmed. And now I'll zoom into Tompkins County a little bit. And I will run a report. Um, and yeah, I'll run a report now. So I'll call it Tompkins uh, Approaching Terrestrial Plants. And I will select the uh, boundary area. So use existing geography. I'll choose county again. It looks like it's loading a little bit. Um, but you did just see this, so I'll just kind of glaze over this a little bit. The, the county map will uh, show up. And then you just click the county you're looking for. So I'm looking for Tompkins County. And uh, then you click the run report button. And so I saved this one as a PDF. And so, oh wait, did I, I think I skipped over. So you have to switch to approaching region, and then you get to pick the, the search distance. So I think I picked 10 miles from my report. Um, so you can see that here. It tells you that you filtered on species type and habitat type, terrestrial plant, and that I selected 10 miles. And then you see the list of the species. Um, and so I chose a pretty small distance. So if you pick a wider, um, buffer, you would get more species that are kind of on the horizon. Um, so some of these might just be kind of common uh, underreported species. Um, other ones might be new to the area, high priority species for um, surveys or for, to keep your eye out for at least. Um, so those are those two examples. And then I'm not going to run any more reports, but I'll just briefly take a look at the infested area report. Um, and so you'll see in this one, um, you can enter in the species that you're interested in, um, enter in your your dates. Um, so these area reports, um, you kind of enter the your parameters into the report tool rather than the filter tool. Um, so you enter in your dates, you choose what area unit you want to use, so square meters versus acres, for example. Um, and then for if you want to include include points and lines, so those of course don't have any area associated, but if you have a lot of point and line data and you want that incorporated somehow, you can um, choose how to turn those into uh, having an area value. For example, you could assume your points are all one square meter infestations, um, and same for uh, presence lines, uh, the distance buffer would be Oh, and sorry, this is the radial distance buffer. So it will be a one meter radius around the point. Um, so 
it would be uh, more than one square meter. Um, and so you can also pick a radial buffer for the present slides as well. And so you would run that and it would give you that report. And then the area treated report is quite similar. Um, so same same thing, you enter in the species and dates you're interested in and pick the uh, area units that you want. So square kilometers, acres, et cetera. Um, in this case, you don't have to worry about points and lines because treatment records are only polygons. Um, but you do have this option to uh, decide how you want to deal with the overlap. So sometimes treatment records overlap each other and you can decide if you want to um, double count those overlapping areas or if you kind of want to dissolve all of the polygons. Um, and I think I'll leave my brief walkthrough at that and head back to my PowerPoint. Um, I'll do a quick check. Are there any questions at this point? So I see that question from Teresa. Um, I don't think there's a way to filter on all for all state forests, um, but there is a uh, conservation lands polygon. Um, so you could um, run reports for like uh, one state forest at a time. Um, yeah, I think that would be the closest thing to doing that. Um, and that is actually a good segue into the next section. Um, so we kind of focused the first half an hour on the IMAP reports, which are sort of quick options for simple uh, data summaries and snapshots and quick looks at the data, um, but they can't do everything. So in some cases, you need a summary that goes beyond what can what a report can do. Um, and so in that case, people often need to work with the data outside of IMAP um, to get what they need. And so the two main options for that are exports and the web map services. Um, and I'll briefly go through what those two options mean. Um, so the web map services, um, those are for people in GIS platforms often. Um, they're really great because it offers a live, always current view of the IMAP data. You can essentially pull in live IMAP, IMAP data into your web map or your ArcGIS um, projects that you have going on uh, to, to kind of have the, the data um, in a place where you can look at it with other data sets and also do uh, complicated analyses and stuff like that. Um, it's really great for overlaying IMAP layers with data that's not in IMAP. Uh, it's also great for maps or analyses that need to be continually updated and repeated and rerun periodically. Um, so if you use the, the IMAP web map services, um, it will automatically always be updated. You won't have to do repeated exports to add in new data. It'll just always be there. Um, but one caveat is that it doesn't have the full IMAP uh, list of fields, um, it has a, a restricted list of fields um, so that it it loads well and is easier to work with. Um, exports um, are probably more commonly used. Um, they're kind of one-time static snapshots of IMAP data. Um, so if you need some fields that are not available in the web map service, that might be one reason to go to exports. Um, or if you're working with a very large amount of data, in an advanced analysis, it might be easier to use the exports um, rather than having the web map services um, load because it can be slow if it's a large amount of data, like if it's many species or a large area. Um, exports are also useful if you want a copy of the data to, to store permanently. Um, and if you're using a GIS program for our 10.6 uh, IMAP, and you need anything besides the confirmed presence layers, um, at that point, exports will probably work better. Um, and if it's a one-time static map or a one-time analysis that you're doing, the exports usually work just fine for that. 
Um, so first, I'll give a little bit more info on the web, the, the web map uh, services. Um, so some examples would be you can display a distribution for a certain species on your website. Um, or you can pull in invasive species data into a project um, like an ArcGIS desktop project, for example. And so um, it's, it's the same service that powers the main IMAP map. So it's the same data you see on IMAP, um, always current. And uh, you can use it to create your own maps in GIS online and other GIS software. And so for, for a quick definition of what a web map service is, um, these are internet services which deliver map image tiles or geographic data to mapping applications like ArcGIS Online or um, ArcGIS Pro or ArcMap. And then whatever application you're using, it makes a request for the data um, within a specific bounding box. So usually whatever your map view is. And so this kind of lays out what programs uh, work with the IMAP web map services. Um, and so you can see ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online. Um, there's a lot of functionality there that you can take advantage of. Um, the one limitation in ArcGIS Online would be uh, you can't really perform intense spatial analyses like you can in desktop programs. And then the one limitation in ArcGIS Pro is that you can't do the dashboards and story, and story maps that you use um, ArcGIS Online for. Um, and then for ArcMap, um, it's a little bit more limited, but you can still use the web map services, especially for uh, the presence rep for the the presence confirmed presence data. Um, and this is a just a, a screenshot of what the fields are in each of the the web map services. So, for instance, if you um, just need like species and date and that sort of basic information. Um, and there is also some more information um, than the web map service would work for you. Um, if you need some fields that are not on that list, then maybe you would need to go to the exports. And just to give a, a quick general workflow of how you would go about using the web map services, um, it kind of you you open up your map, whether it's a web map that you're working on or uh, a project on your desktop, ArcGIS software, um, you open that up and then you go to, to add a data layer and you, you choose the add layer by URL option and you have to plug in a URL there. And you can get that URL from the IMAP web app services directory, which I'll show you where that is in a second. Um, for example, you could get a layer for the presence data or a layer for um, the expected data. And then use filters um, in the case of ArcGIS Online or definition queries if you're in ArcGIS Pro or another desktop program um, to filter on the data you need. For instance, species ID equals 342. So if you're only interested in the uh, records for a certain species or a certain date range, um, you can kind of apply those filters and then the data will load uh, faster because it'll be a smaller amount of data. And then you can further customize. Um, so for example, in IMAP, um, presence records for all species are green, um, but you could adjust the, the symbology so that you have different colors for several different species that you're mapping. And that was just a really quick overview. Um, all of the details on how to do those things are laid out in our help doc. So you can find that on our training page. Um, there's a PDF on the web map services that goes through all of the things I just showed in more detail, like how to get to the directory um, of all the different service links and how to navigate there, the capabilities in each of the platforms, um, how to choose which service links to use, how to filter, how to find species ID numbers if you want to filter on a species, um, and all sorts of tips, troubleshooting, and guidance. And you can also free to feel free to reach out to us if you um, need more guidance on that. And then, so I'll just go back to the slide real quick. 
So that was web map services, um, which is really useful for like repeated analyses and uh, pulling in data to your GIS platform. Um, but if you're doing more one time data snapshots, or you need some of those additional fields, um, then you would go to exports. Um, so I'll give a quick. Uh, one slider on the export tool. Uh, so I think this tool is probably more more used than the web map services. Um, many of you are probably familiar with it. Um, so it's in the same export slash report button, just toggled to reports or toggle to exports. And so the first thing you have an option to choose the export type. Um, if you just want a quick quick uh, table of the data, you can choose CSV to get a spreadsheet. Um, and then there are two, uh, and that will include like latitude and longitude. But if you want an actual spatial file to uh, bring into uh, your ArcGIS platform, or for instance, you need the polygons, um, then you'd want to use either the, the geodatabase or the shape file. Um, we generally recommend the geodatabase as being quicker and simpler, but uh, you can use either one. It's kind of whatever you're more familiar with or what you envision working better with whatever um, program you're using or what use you have for it. Um, uh, just a reminder that the the exports can also respond to the filters, just like the reports. And so you'll see this use current filter uh, toggle. And it's when you have no filters on, it's just defaulted to being grayed out, and um, it's toggled off because there's no filter to use. Um, if you do put on a filter, it will default to on, and so it'll toggle to the right and be green. Um, but you can toggle it off if you actually don't want it to be used. Um, just like uh, with the reports, you can select a boundary area. Um, so you can select just the data in your county or just your prism. Um, but the default, um, it'll be toggled off and it will just export based on your extent. So whatever you can see on your map view, so on your rectangular browser window, um, whatever you can see in there is what's going to export by default, unless you choose a geography. Um, just another reminder that the exports respond to the layers on off, just like those reports do as well. Um, so you can, you can click this list here and it'll actually show you the list of layers that are being queried for your export. And there are, is also more information, so help pages on the exports and the web map services. And then you click the export records button and that, that downloads your export. Um, so it'll be a zip folder with files for each data layer. Um, and one, one thing to be aware of is that the presence data does get split up into um, a separate file for each of the different layers. So there's the point line and polygon layer. Um, all of the other, well, that would also happen for unconfirmed unconfirmed presences, um, but for not detected searched area and treatment, those are all polygons. So that would just be one layer. And there is a little note on here um, about exporting data. You'll only export data visible and permissible through your account. Um, so that is a good reminder that there are a couple limitations to the exports. Um, for instance, there's a 10,000 record limit. Um, there's also some permissions at play. So for instance, for unconfirmed records, you can only um, export your own unconfirmed records or records within your uh, unconfirmed records within an organization that you administer. Um, and if you're uh, if those limits are a problem, um, then feel free to contact us and we can uh, get you the data you need that way. Um, and just another reminder that this is a static snapshot of the data at the moment that you export it. So once new data comes in, um, you would need to be updating your database, um, which is one reason to consider the IMAP web map services. Okay, so that was uh, my spiel. Uh, so. I'll just quickly wrap up and then we can get to the discussion and questions. Um, so my only wrap up is that uh, uh, we hope you, you tune in again next week. Um, 
or sorry, next month. So this this month's webinar was a little bit technical. Um, next month's will be a little bit more big picture. So we'll have some user stories from people from 2022 about how they used IMAP. Um, so kind of similar to what what Brittany uh, presented at the beginning, we'll have more more of that sort of presentation. Um, and I did also want to mention that we have our HWA mapping challenge coming back for 2023. Uh, it was the first year last year. Um, so if you want more information on that, go to nyimapinvasives.org slash HWA. Um, that starts on February 1st. Um, and we're hoping we engage volunteers across the state on that. Um, and with that, I thank you all so much for joining and I will go into the discussion. So, and also thank Brittany so much for her presentation at the beginning. So are there any questions from the audience um, that should be covered? Um, questions for me or questions for Brittany about her work? So I don't, oh, was someone about to talk? I, this is Jen. I was just gonna um, talk about the question that Steve had in the chat, um, because sometimes like either the internet's running slow or IMAP's running slow. And it seems like if sometimes if you run a report, especially a really big one, like if it's a statewide, it can take a long time to load. And um, I have tried to like force it to quit within that tab. And it doesn't seem like that's possible. I, I find that you have to actually like close the tab if you, if you truly want to like end your loading um, a attempt uh, to generate a report. But I have found that like if you just open a new tab, like sometimes I'll right click on the in the menu to like load a new tab new tab of the map or like um, um, just to continue my work. If I eventually go back to that tab, report will be there. Sometimes it just takes a really long time if it's a complicated query or if the you know interwebs tunnels are, are clogged up for the day. Thanks. Um, and uh, people feel free to keep typing in any questions that come up. Um, I did also want to just kind of ask the audience um, if anyone would like to share. Um, how are people currently using IMAP reports? Or if you're not using them in your work yet, do you have any new ideas for how to use the reports? Um, or any any suggestions or just any any thoughts on on reports? Um, and you can feel free to enter that into the chat. I'll also open up the participants list. So if anyone wants to talk, um, you can raise your hand, I believe. So I'll keep an eye out for that. Um, so a comment from Teresa, thanks so much. Uh, reporting current fines on state lands in her management area for incorporation into their upcoming unit management plan. Um, so yeah, that's a great use of the report tool. Good. Uh, just uh, kind of zoom into your management area and then run a species list by geography report um, and for geography select that management area. Um, from Steve, I think they're helpful to see what invasives you know are there but appear on the promotion, uh, excuse me, <laughs> but appear on the approaching region list. Um, yeah, that's a great way to use it. Um, if I'm going to a new county, sometimes I do a uh, approaching region list for that county, and maybe I'll see something on there like um, one of the knotweed species or uh, bittersweet or something that I think it's probably there. Um, um, and then I can kind of keep my eye out for that and report it. Scrolling through the participant list, don't see any hands raised. Um, I'll stop the recording now in case anyone doesn't want to be recorded. 
Mitch, I'll, I'll throw one out there just because um, I get a lot of questions from our confirmers network and I see a lot of people on the list here that do a lot of confirming for us in IMAP. Um, you know, they want to know like how many records have they confirmed? And so um, it's nice that you can utilize like the tools within the filter. So there is a filter for verified by and you can put your own name in there. And then you could run, say, a species list by geography report um, for, like, say, New York State, and it'll give you a list of all the species and account of all those species um, that you have actually done the confirming for. So it might be helpful for your own reporting and things like that. You can hang it on the wall and be proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great point. And so that's in the presence tab. And you would put your name and species verified by, and then run the report on that. 